All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Akash Varma. I'm a doctor in New York. Um, today, we're going to be speaking about leprosy um, for our February webinar for the Glow Drum Training Committee. Today, we have with us Dr. Akinkube, Dr. Odiase, and Dr. Aino um, speaking for us from Nigeria. And um, just wanted to go over some housekeeping things. Um, first of all, welcome to our webinar this year. Thank you so much for attending. Um, today, the host is me, Dr. Akash Varma, and Dr. Cindy Lord from Kenya. Um, so the Glodrum Training Committee, um, as some of you may know, we're the International Alliance for Global Health Dermatology, and our goal is to promote knowledge equity by improving access to education for dermatology trainees across the world. We aim to provide free educational events and opportunities to build networks and collaborate. So this year, um, you know, we're working on getting our talks ready, but you know, this month we're dedicated to promoting knowledge about leprosy, um, both through this talk and through posts that we have on Instagram and on our social media pages. And we are also um, going to have a research leadership and management talk um, next month that we'll speak about at the end of the talk. So just some you know, quick housekeeping tasks. So your audio is going to be muted and your camera will be turned off for the duration of this webinar. There will be a live quiz after the case presentations and talk, and you'll be able to participate anonymously using the Zoom poll function. The meeting hosts will guide you through this. That includes me and Dr. Lord. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat and we'll share them with the speakers at the end of the webinar. And we'll also be sharing some information about the Glodrum Training Committee in the chat as well. And I'll be starting, we'll be starting the presentation shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to have you here for today's learning session. I am Dr. Temitayo Aino, a resident in the Dermatology Unit of Lagos University Teaching Hospital here in Nigeria. I'll be taking the first two clinical cases on Anson's disease. And the background is the scenic view of our hospital. The first case is a 28-year-old Nigerian lady who's single, a graduate, and unemployed who had a five-year history of recurrent generalized skin rash that started gradually as reddish wheel-like lesions that were non-itchy and were not painful. There was no history of contact with anyone with similar skin condition. Uh, drug history was however significant for chronic use of topical and oral steroids, which were initially prescribed by a GP for the lesions, but she continued self-medicating on them because of the occasional relief she was able to get from the use of this medication. Other history were not significant. Skin examination showed widespread, well-defined erythematous wheels and hypopigmented patches on her trunk, as shown in the lower slides and on her limbs as shown on the upper slides. Some areas were, were indurated. She also had thickened on her nerves, however, sensation was preserved. No remarkable findings in the other systems. In view of this, a diagnosis of suspected ANSYS disease, likely borderline tuberculosis, was made. She was investigated in line with the diagnosis. She had a skin slits and smear for demonstration of acid fast bacilli, which was negative. She also had skin biopsy done, whose findings were consistent with leprosy. Her holder and ciliary tests were unremarkable. These are the histology slide. The black arrow illustrates the infiltrates in the papillary dermis, and they were mostly lymphocytes. See, 
On this second slide, you could see the overlying epidemics looking unremarkable. I could also see the granuloma, which was formed in the papillary dermis, and the yellow arrow points to the multinucleated Langan giant cell. We also have the infiltrate surrounding some adnexa structures. Here, we have them partially surrounding and also infiltrating a muscle, most likely the arretopili muscle, and here surrounding the sweat glands. In line with the diagnosis, she was treated with multibacillary drug therapy and had monthly doses of infampicin and clofazimine, and also daily doses of clofazimine and dapsone. She was referred to our National Leprosy Center where she had the medications free of charge and followed up at her dermatology clinic. Contact tracing has been quite difficult, um, especially because one year prior to the manifestations of her skin lesions, she had a compulsory National Youth Service um, done. And however, we, the public health physicians are on the case. She had initial improvement while on treatment, but six months down the treatment, she had worsening symptoms with new eruptions on the identified locations on the body shown in the picture. And the diagnosis of lepra one reaction was made. She was managed with low dose oral steroids for one month. This is her at eight months on treatment. And this is our most recent picture during our follow-up. Well, here she has fewer erythematous patches on the body and also flattening of the plaques. You can also see on the breast, the striae, which is the side effect of our indiscriminate use of topical steroids. She's doing much better. I'm pleased with her progress, um, but obviously she would rather have all the lesions gone completely. In summary, I've spoken about a 28-year-old lady with a five-year history of skin lesions and subsequent diagnosis of borderline tuberculoid leprosy being made. She was managed with multibacillary drug therapy, and six months down the line of treatment, she had lepra one reaction, which was treated with oral steroids. She's doing much better with improvement in her skin lesion as shown by these two pictures. The second case is a 36 year old Nigerian man, married a university graduate, but unemployed with a 21 month history of worsening generalized body rash that started gradually as few reddish, non-itchy, non-painful lesions that later became florid with lump formation in some parts of the body. He initially thought it was spiritual attack and so did not seek medical assistance on time. These are the important negatives and positives in his history. On clinical examination, he noticed erythematous nodules and plaques on various parts of his body, on the face, and some were looking infiltrated. He also had this lana fasciae. You can see the nodules on his pinna on both sides, and also some on his neck. Similar lesions on his trunk and his abdomen and his limbs, upper limbs. In view of this, a diagnosis of lepromatous leprosy was made and it was scheduled for investigation, which included a skin biopsy, a skin slit and smear for demonstration of acid fast bacilli and some other ancillary investigations. He, however, defaulted from his follow-up appointment, but we were recently able to make contact with his next of kin, who assured us he would be in clinic soonest. Thank you for listening.
So I'll be handing over to my colleague who will be taking the third case. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the Blue Den team for this opportunity. I'll be continuing the case presentation this afternoon with an interesting differential of Hansen's disease. The patient is a 63-year-old female Nigerian farmer who had a five-week history of toothache, facial swelling, and ulcers, which were initially painless, but later became painful. She had a prior history of paresthesia on the face. There was no fever, an aesthetic lesion, motherosis, or myopathy. She is a known hypertensive, and her family and social history were not contributory here. At the onset of her symptoms, she was taken to a general hospital in her state, Delta State, from where she was referred to a tertiary hospital in a nearby town. There, the ulcers were debrided, and six of her teeth were extracted. She was referred to the oral maxillofacial surgery team at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, our center, on the request of her relatives who live in Lagos and wanted her close by. Our unit dermatology unit were invited to review based on the histology results. A clinical presentation, the patient had ulcers, which involved her forehead, nasal bridge, psychomatic arch, and her upper palate. She also had necrotic tissue and generalized facial edema. She had a wound subculture done, which grew proteus vulgaris sensitive to imipenem, meropenem, and amikacin, and she had meropenem given. Moderate anemia and mild lymphocytosis were seen on complete blood counts, and erythrocyte sedimentation rate was elevated at 137 millimeters per hour. She had other ancillary investigations carried out. A histologic diagnosis of leprosy was made. However, we correlated clinically and failed this picture was more of mycobacterium ulcerum disease. Unfortunately, we were unable to carry out a PCRO test to prove this. She was managed by a multidisciplinary team of the oral maxillofacial surgeons, infectious disease unit, and dermatology unit. She was managed as a case of leprosy with dapsone, clavacemine, and rifampicin because of the histology result and the fact that we're in an endemic zone. It's important, however, to note that in the management of mycobacterium ulcerous disease, rifampicin is indicated. So she was more or less treated for both diseases and she showed remarkable improvement. This is a patient at six months post discharge. You can see most of the ulcers have healed, but the zygomatic arches, she had loss of tissue here. So she was planned for facial reconstruction and she completed her treatment and eventually returned to her state. Unfortunately, we have been unable to follow up with this patient since she left. Thank you so much for listening. I'll now hand over to Dr. Akin Kube. Good day. Um, I do hope you have enjoyed case presentations. We picked these cases particularly so that we could highlight the various clinical presentations of leprosy. And I hope that um, with the ensuing lecture, um, you will be more informed concerning these presentations and how to manage patients going forward. I bring you greetings from Lagos, Nigeria, where we are based. The learning outcomes for participants today are to be able to identify the various presentations of this condition, to highlight the clinical diagnostic challenges, and then community approach to treatment of Hansen's disease. I will be using this outline for my talk. Leprosy was renamed Hansen's disease after the Norwegian scientist Gerhard Hansen in 1873, when he discovered the slow-growing bacterium. 
it is a chronic infectious disease and it is caused by the mycobacterium leprae. It affects people of all races all around the world. It is most common in warm, wet areas in the tropics and subtropics. And my country, Nigeria, where I come from, is falls within this um, region. And so we also find leprosy quite commonly in our environment. It affects the nerves, the skin, the eyes, the respiratory tract, the nasal mucosa, the bones and the testes. It has a long incubation period of three to five years. However, this can stretch for as long as 20 years. Males are twice more affected than females. Symptoms occur within a year, but it can take much longer. And this is what also contributes to the diagnostic challenge that um, is experienced with leprosy. The affected skin changes color. It becomes dry or flaky and there's loss of feeling. The mycobacterium leprae attacks the nerves and this results in nerve damage and disabilities. The resultant effect of this is social stigma, there's ostracism, and there's denial of human rights. And these last things I have mentioned is what brings about problems that we actually have, the challenges with leprosy and leprosy patients because of the disability that has resulted. And this is why leprosy still is a problem in the areas that are affected. And this is also why it is being brought to the fore, the fore and celebrated um, as a day for World Leprosy Day to bring, to, to, to highlight the challenges that, it, that occur. Multiduct therapy has been made available through the WHO free of charge to all patients all over the world since 1995. So it reaches all communities and areas in the world. It provides a highly effective cure for all types of leprosy. In the year 2000, leprosy was eliminated as a public health problem. And this was because it, it was defined as reaching a prevalence of less than one case per 10,000 persons. In the past 20 years, we've had over 16 million leprosy patients treated with multidrug therapy. The data, however, shows that even though um, the overall number of cases are slowly declining, with the global efforts and the resources that have been deployed to interrupt transmission, there are still a number of new cases. And this just doesn't align with what is you know, going on globally in terms of the strategy for the elimination of leprosy. For 2020, 127 countries reported, uh, gave data for 2020 on leprosy. What it was found was that high rates of new cases were found in the Africa region and the Southeast Asian region. There were over 127,000 new cases of leprosy detected with a prevalence rate of 16.6. The highest proportion of cases, both registered for treatment and new cases detected, were actually found in the Southeast Asian region. 12 countries reported 1,000 to 10,000 new cases. However, Brazil, India, and Indonesia reported more than 10,000 new cases each. Over 8,600 children were amongst these new cases. Those are children less than 15 years, with a new detection, new case detection rate of 4.4 per million child population. Amongst the new cases, approximately 7,000 have grade two disabilities, and the grade two disability rate is 0.9 per million population. So these are the factors that we look at when we look at the in terms of um, stigma, ostracization, and the disability rate that they have, which now makes them more vulnerable within the various communities that they live in. And what is quite clear is that with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, obviously programs have been um, disrupted, implementation, case detection, reaching the communities worldwide, this has been, you know, affected. And there has been a reduction in the new case detection by 37% in the year 2020 when compared with the preceding year. So this just shows the three main areas, Brazil, India, and Indonesia, where you have, you know, greater than 10,000 in the darkest blue color, 10,000 um, new cases. And then the um, countries that were highlighted um, as having up to 1,000, they were mainly from Africa. So you have the DRC, Ethiopia, Madagascar, Nigeria, Mozambique. And then in Southeast Asia, you have Myanmar, Nepal, Philippines, Sri Lanka, 
um, that have recorded these values. The clinical picture of leprosy is varied, so I'm highlighting this again, and early identification is needed. And the best way to diagnose cases is actually from clinical experience and paying particular attention to the dermatological and neurological findings. So what does a skin examination entail? It should be a complete examination of the skin and it should happen in good light. So it must be in a, an area where you either have good lighting or natural light by the window. This will help to um, showcase the lesions clearly to enable the individuals to make a difference and make a diagnosis. These skin lesions could be macules, they could be papules or nodules. There may be absence of sweating, which may be noticed, hair loss, changes in the texture of the skin. Then you may have hypo or hyperpigmented flat or raised lesions. And these lesions are usually found on the face, the ears, the trunk, the extremities, the buttocks or the thighs. And any suspected skin lesion must be examined for light touch. So you could use your sensory monofilament, or you could simply use a cotton wisp. You may also have skin ulcers. There could be tender red nodules. There could be edema of the face, the extremities, the ears as well. And then you have what you call an asaka, which occurs mainly in the type 1, but particularly in type 2 reactions, the lepra reactions. You should also look out for madurosis, where there's loss of hair on the eyebrows and the eyelashes. And we should examine particularly the legs, you know, looking at the skin to check for dryness, check for cracks and fissured skin and scaly eruptions. So I'll be taking the question for the first um, poll, just to test our knowledge of leprosy, the classification of leprosy. What classification of leprosy are you aware of? So you can take all the options that you know. The first option, So the first option, Okay, so um, the classification, WHO classification, the ILDS classification, Madrid, so we've seen the percentages that everybody picked here. So everything but the ILDS classification is right. So the ILDS classification is wrong. Okay, so that's the first question. So we can go on. So recognition of leprosy in an endemic area of leprosy itself one needs to have a high index of suspicion. If you've had an acute or a chronic atypical rash that has not been diagnosed or fails to respond to treatment, then you must think of leprosy. And so we find that physicians should generally have leprosy in their differential diagnosis in endemic areas of leprosy. For the physician to make and improve their diagnostic acumen, they need to know what to look for. They need to know how to integrate these clinical signs and be able to make a diagnosis. So your clinical description alongside your findings will help make a, a, a diagnosis. So we have the WHO classification and this is helpful and it's helpful mainly for physicians so that the condition is picked up even earlier. What you find you're looking out for is a clinical feature on the skin lesion. So that would be your macules, flat lesions, the papules, or nodules. And in possibacillary leprosy, where you have one to five lesions with an asymmetrical distribution and a definite loss of sensation, this is the possibacillary type of leprosy. And the other classification is a multibacillary leprosy, where you have more than five lesions, it's symmetrically distributed, 
and loss of sensation may or may not be present. There are other classifications of leprosy, and these are mainly based on the clinical, the bacteriological, the immunological, and histological status of the patient. You have the Indian, the Madrid, the Ridley, and Joplin, and the WHO. The WHO is, world, is, is used worldwide and is simple. It's meant to be used even by non-medical personnel who, have, who are on the field and have been um, trained to recognize this lesion. So it is um, the most commonly used type of classification. The Ridley and Joplin classification is used more for research purposes. And of course, as dermatologists, you know, want to um, define more specifically using this type of classification. And the Indian classification just purely has the pure, purely neuritic type of leprosy included in its classification. So a hypochromic patch or the simple presence of a single or several hypochromic patches on the skin is a common feature of leprosy and particularly in dark skin individuals. And it is actually important that we identify these lesions, um, leprous lesions early. So it's a common feature. Its identification is important. The clinical examination needs care and skill, and it should be complete. And this will help to um, avoid diagnostic errors. You need to check for your superficial sensitivity and check for nerve enlargements. There are many things that cause a hypochromic patch and many differentials, particularly you know, in this same environment, and this needs to be looked at. So you have pityriasis vesicola, pityriasis alba, nevus acromicus, you could have repigmenting vitiligo, you could have segmental vitiligo, and you can also have the patch stage um, mycosis from voidis. So I will be showing a couple of pictures which will help us in looking at these various presentations. So here on the left, you can see the first picture shows um, hypopigmented, scaly, mildly scaly lesions on the arm. They're a bit more wider here, a few patches, and they're slightly scaly. This is pityriasis versicola. And on the extreme right, we have a large patch of hypopigmentation with several smaller macules of hyperpigmentation. And this was treated as some um, seborrheic dermatitis. And many times you can have seborrheic dermatitis coexisting alongside pityriasis vesicola. So you find also the hypochromic patches. So you have these diffuse, symmetrical, fairly well demarcated hypopigmented patches of varying size. You look out for the raised edges. You find that there are a lot more. Here, you're looking at the neck and the upper chest. They are found mainly on the trunk, the periumbilical area, the back, the gluteal area, the upper arms, and the feet. So the complete skin examination is very, very important so that one can actually classify the type of leprosy and then you know, go on to manage appropriately. More pictures of the hypochromic patch. The lady on the left, you can see this hype. The patch extends from the temple to the cheeks, and then around the chin area where you find their smaller macules, hyperpigmented macules. This is also pityriasis vesicola. The lady in the middle has widespread hyperpigmentation on the forehead in the nasolabial area extending to the chin. However, it's the picture on the right that shows more clearly the demarcation. And you can see that the, ed the, the edge is raised, and the border is fairly well defined. And this patient was, you know, managed for leprosy. More pictures here, you find a segmental distribution of this hypochromic patch extending to the back. On the top right, you have the hyperpigmented patch with nodules and some infiltration. Differentials here would include leprosy, would also be sarcoidosis, think of um, Chagrin's patch and tuberous sclerosis. The bottom right picture has multiple hypopigmented patches, different sizes, um, and you can find they're all coalescing in certain areas. And this was a case of the patch stage of mycosis for voidies. Here you can appreciate the hypopigmented plaques. You can see they look real like they're raised. They're a bit, you know, the color is very hard to appreciate, but it's a bit xanthochromatic. 
The coppery red color in Hansen's disease is not easily appreciated in the skin of color. However, it can be, find, be found in some individuals that are nearer the Fitzpatrick skin type 4. So the ridley joplin classification just takes, it, takes into account the spectrum of um, leprosy. You have two ends of the condition. So you have the tubercular type, which is stable, and the lepromatous type. And in between, you have the indeterminate stages, which are unstable. So you have your borderline tuberculoid, borderline, the borderline lepromatous. This, the cell-mediated immunity is greater at the tuberculoid end of the spectrum, and of course, markedly reduced at the lepromatous end, where you also have a higher bacterial load. So this picture is for the second question. So based on the ridley joplin classification, what is the most likely type of leprosy? So those are the pictures of the patients. So these are the options. Tuberculoid. So we have the options here and the percentages that people picked. So the correct answer actually is lepromatous leprosy. That's because the patient had multiple nodules. He had purple, he had purple blood. And also he had a learning pressure. So that's the answer to that question. Thank you. Lesions on the air are found in Hansen's disease, but they can also be found in conditions that mutilate the air, where you have similar destruction that is seen in leprosy. Conditions like lupus vulgaris, leishmaniasis, lupus erythematosus, keloids, uh, sarcoidosis, lobos disease. And if you look at the ear, you can see that it's infiltrated, it's reddened, erythematous, and you can see these nodular lesions, which are quite clear. It's also important to look for other findings. While, you know, when you examine the patient, you might find the ichthyosis on the legs, the skin changes, you look for sensory autonomic and motor neuropathy, maybe anhydrosis, dryness. There's also um, diffuse lepromatous infiltration, which is why you have the leonine fasci on the forehead, the skin. There could also be gynecomastia as a result of the infiltration the testes, testicular involvement. And then looking at the nails also could have dystrophic nail changes due to the disease itself or as a secondary complication of a fungal infection. <coughs> Here we now talk about plaque differentials. So differentials of the plaque that you may find in um, leprosy. Other things that give you a similar plaque be sarcoidosis, leishmaniasis, psoriasis, and microcis fungoides. So your history would play an important role here. Your complete skin examination, looking for other telltale signs of these other conditions, and then your investigations would contribute. So just showing you a picture here on the trunk of an infiltrated lesion, hyperpigmented center, and then a plaque surrounding the picture on the left. And the one on the right, you can find multiple plaques of varying sizes. There's also widespread hypopigmentation, and then you can see the nodules studded on that patch. Here again, you can see this is a well demarcated plaque, fairly well demarcated. It's hyperpigmented. The differential here was sarcoidosis. 
the lesion on the right, you can see it's wheel-like, looks indurated, sarcoid is also a differential, leprosy is also a differential, and here when you do your skin biopsy, as, as alongside your other clinical findings, then you would be able to clinch the diagnosis. But it's, this is just to highlight the presentations of lesions that are bear, set, uh, bear resemblance to leprosy. To this lady on the that you can see on the screen, you could see that there were some nodules, raised plaques, she had them on the nape of the neck, and another hyperpigmented plaque on the forehead with a raised edge. She had the biopsy done and the diagnosis was sarcoidosis. Another plaque on the chest looks infiltrated, looks, you know, there are no other obvious lesions. The man on the right, I think, was the same patient, if I remember correctly. Um, he had infiltrations um, of the lip. You can see the rim of the lip, the upper lip. And then more ulcers and nodular lesions on the lower limbs. These nodular lesions of the lower limb can easily break down to form ulcers. And this picture shows um, a woman with hypo but slightly erythematous plaques that are well defined, scaly, involving the forehead, cheeks, chin, the ears. And we had quite a few differentials, psoriasis, sarcoidosis, leprosy, but the biopsy diagnosis, the histological diagnosis was um, psoriasis at the end of the day. This young man, you can see on the left, has a well demarcated plaque on the frontal aspect of the scalp. It's hyperpigmented. There is some associated scaling, but he also had quite significant hyperpigmentation around the nasolabial area and the forehead. And it did appear rather infiltrated with the lesions on the upper chest. And so our, ma our main diagnosis was sebosoriasis, but we also felt you know, we should rule out Hansen's disease and a biopsy confirmed it was sebosoriasis. The lesions on the right, hyperpigmented plaques, few nodular lesions on the forearm, this individual. Here we have multiple hypopigmented patches. Picture on the right, you could see the, appreciate the surrounding erythema. There are multiple hypopigmented patches, and then most of them have coalesced into this widespread patch. This was the patch stage of MF confirmed of diagnosis of histology. And here we just show, demonstrate um, ulnar nerve palsy that you can find with Hansen's disease. So back to one of the cases that we um, presented, you can obviously see that um, this is this was the uh, lepromatous type of leprosy. You can see the infiltration of the skin on the forehead, giving him the leonine um, fasces, the upper lip is infiltrated, the nasal, which is not clearly shown here, the nasal um, area was infiltrated with nodules as well, and then on the body you have a various, on the trunk, you have various lesions, nodules, macules, plaques, slightly scaly, all presenting in this particular patient. So now, a slit skin and smear is one of the investigations that we carried out for a patient, you know, when you're thinking of Hansen's disease. The procedure is best carried out by well-trained individuals who know what they're doing and can um, carry out the procedure. Uh, the skin is pinched up and a slit is made using the scalpel, about five mm deep, and you want to, you know, pinching it up ensures there's no blood. Then you wipe away any blood or lymph that may ensue, and the, it, the, the lesion is taken, the, the sample is taken from the edge of the lesion. And then when you've made your cut, you use the turn the scalpel on its side, and you now scrape the sides and the bottom of the cut and smear uniformly. And you take from five to six different sites. So it involves the um, forehead, the ears, the chin, the cheek, the buttock. And you would make a smear for each particular um, site that you have done. And the table on the right just shows you the bacteriological index, which also gives you an indication of the number of bacilli and the severity 
And of course, when a repeat slip skin smear is done, one can see the improvement. And ideally, you want to now get to zero bacilli being found. But the infectivity is shown when you, know, you have the highest number of clumps of bacilli. So this is the third question. But the, so the picture is for the question by the side there. 45 year old hairdresser with a one year history of increasing facial lesions, which are asymptomatic. She had been treated for acne without any improvement. Her most important complaint at presentation was her loss of job and reduced social activities. Based on your clinical diagnosis, which is the best treatment option according to WHO guidelines? So the options will come up now. Okay, so um, based on the answers, we have the different um, percentages there. So more people picked the option D, which is rifampicin 600 milligrams monthly, clovacimine 300 milligrams monthly, rifampicin 50 milligrams daily, and DAPS 100 milligrams daily, and that is the correct option. This was for 12 months because the patient had lepromatous leprosy. So very good. Treatment for leprosy is, as I mentioned earlier, free and available worldwide by the WHO. And you have these blister packs. So this is a blister pack for porcibacillary leprosy. You have the pulse treatment once a month, which is supervised, and then you have the daily tablets that are taken. It's easy for the patients who maybe whatever level of education they are, it's easy for them to um, just follow the pattern. And it's just says day one, day two, all the way down to 28 days so that you're able to take it. For the possibacillary, you have six packs, six blister packs. And then for the multibacillary leprosy, you have your pulse treatment, both with rifampicin and clofazamine, and then your daily treatment with clofazamine and dapsol. And same thing happens, it follows a pattern, day one labeled all the way to day 28 to make it easy for patients. So here it is um, more specifically with the durations, you have 600 milligrams of rifampicin monthly, which is supervised, then you have one, 100 milligrams of dapsone self-administered for possibacillary treatment, and this is for six months. And the multibacillary treatment is 600 milligrams of rifampicin, supervised, 300 milligrams of clofazamine supervised, and then your dapsone 100 milligrams daily, and clofazamine 50 milligrams daily unsupervised. And this goes on for 12 months. Initially, it was 24 months, and then um, it says from 1997, it now became 12 months fixed duration. However, in certain cases where you do have problems, you need to work with um, your um, local um, leprosy training center or you know, institute, whereby you do have patients who have a relapse and you know, a skin biopsy or repeat skin slit smear you know, is, is positive. And so this may need to be extended. So the reason for discussing the patients we did was just to generally show you how or bring to light how patients present and the challenges that we have in managing these patients. And I will um, highlight these and use this as 
uh, the way to discuss the way forward and things we need to do better. It's easy to recognize leprosy, but then the next step is the management and making sure that the management is complete, it's total, we reach the contacts, and we actually reach the goal of eliminating leprosy. So these challenges are multifactorial. So you have the patient factor, where there's uninformed you know, patients, they have poor awareness, they have um, poor healthcare seeking habits and attitudes. So in my, in my setting, um, and generally I would say much of developing Africa, you have patients seeking help with the healthcare practitioner, mainly as a last resort. So they would either go to cultural um, leaders, uh, religious leaders, tribal leaders, and the cultural norms and beliefs play a, an important role in um, approach to skin diseases as well. Poverty is very important. Patients are unable to afford to come to see the doctor, so they just go to what's immediately in their environment. They also can't afford some of the investigations and treatments. And so this results in a late presentation. In terms of contact tracing, patients also are sort of self-stigmatized. They don't want to go back home and tell you, you know, who they've been in contact with or and tell them of this disease that they've been told about. Of course, counseling plays an important role, but the truth of the matter is there is still stigmatization. They may not give you adequate contacts. And then after they've seen you, they may go back home. Adherence may not be com uh, you know, com um, complete. Compliance needs to be followed up. So these are issues that we find and have identified, and it just buttresses the point that the community approach really has to come into the fore. So you need to work with the public health physicians, which we, you know, we all need to do and instigate it and make sure it keeps going on because you see the patient in the clinic, they can go and follow up into the community. Then if we talk about the healthcare practitioners, well, first and foremost, there's an inadequate doctor-patient ratio in most developing countries of the world. The ideal recommendation from WHO is one doctor to between 400 and 600 patients. In Nigeria, this is between 1 to 10,000 patients. South Africa, it's 1 to about 1,250. And in the UK, 1 to about 350. 67. So this in itself already means that we aren't able to tackle the vast array of um, skin conditions that could even present in the community or the various countries where we, where we are based. The diagnostic delays and dilemmas come into play because, first of all, the patient presents late, and so one may not recognize this easily. Sometimes it might be our knowledge, and that's why we're highlighting these various clinical presentations. It's important that much as we also train ourselves, we need to step down this training to pharmacists, community extension workers, general practitioners, just, you know, five, six steps to easy recognition of leprosy. If we don't keep doing this and we wait till they walk in through our doors or into our clinics, they will be walking in with the stigma of leprosy, which is already end stage, so to speak. So you need them to come in early. And so that's where we need to collaborate and um, work better with other healthcare practitioners in our various environments so that we can avoid this late presentation, pick them up earlier and afford them better treatment outcomes with a reduction in the disabilities. So working with the GPs, the state programs, and of course the dermatologists. In my environment in, in Nigeria, we find that issues that come to the fore are the fact that the therapy is domiciled at the state programs. So you have patients coming from all over the state and they have to find their way after seeing you, you made the diagnosis, to go and get the treatment somewhere else. Yes, the treatment is free, but it's the access to the treatment that is an issue. And so that is where the public health perspective comes into place. Now, global migration is occurring. We're all aware of this. Natural disasters are happening. People from the developing world are seeking greener pastures elsewhere. There's just mass migration. There are wars everywhere, almost in every region of the world. So this also offers problems. You have poverty-related circumstances, which include poor hygiene, 
overcrowding, displacement, the displacement, you have people in camps all over the place or in different regions of the world, there's lack of personal hygiene. So of course your various other neglected tropical diseases are coming to the fore. So what we have is the stakeholders already exist, but there's a focus on other diseases. And we'll start with the present. There's a focus on other diseases like the COVID pandemic for the past two years, that has been the issue. And this has resulted in the statistics that have been reported for 2020. But even prior to the, um, the, the pandemic, we had a focus on TB and HIV for the past three decades, malaria. And so that's why the neglected topical diseases are coming to the fore. And it is important that we renegotiate, we re-emphasize the, um, the importance of leprosy and other neglected tropical diseases. There's also gaps in communication and sharing information. And I mentioned earlier access to treatment. The treatment is not at each primary health care center, which is what it should be. It sh the patients should be able to access this treatment easily. Funding for Hansen's disease is, is relatively insufficient. We have the NGOs, you know, because the focus is elsewhere. So we need to bring this back to the table. Partnerships exist, but they need strength. So in summary, Despite this overall reduction in the worldwide prevalence of leprosy, it still continues to constitute a public health problem. There's increased mobility of people. I have already talked about this. For the household contacts, immediate and annual examinations are recommended. Do we all do this? Are we able to do this? So like I mentioned earlier, it's a re-collaboration or a strengthening of the collaboration with the public health physicians. We need them to go into the community. We need to be able to give them names and, and, and contacts of persons so they can follow up so that, you know, you don't say the person is free until five years after his last contact with the person who's infectious. I think these are the steps that we need to take proactively that can help us eliminate leprosy. All physicians must have a basic understanding of the disease and be able to suspect and identify leprosy. And then we must create awareness, reduce the stigma by celebrating World Leprosy Day. So just briefly, it's an opportunity. It's celebrated um, the last Sunday in in January yearly, um, it's to celebrate people who have experienced leprosy, raise awareness, call for an end to leprosy related stigma and discrimination. This year, the campaign calls for United for Dignity. So it's meant to honor the dignity of those who have experienced leprosy. We want to share their empowering stories. We want to advocate for their mental well being and the right to a dignified life that's free from disease related stigma. And then the new global leprosy strategy, it still follows the same vision, which is zero tolerance of zero figures for leprosy, zero infection, zero disease, zero disability, zero stigma and discrimination. And the goal is elimination of leprosy, which is defined as an interruption of transmission. So these are the global targets, 120 countries with zero autochthonous cases, 70% reduction in annual number of new cases, reduction in the rates per million population of those with grade two disability. And the rest of these can be um, easily looked up, but it's important to finalize by saying, you know, these strategic pillars and key components need to be adhered to both on a countrywide basis with the uh, involvement of non-governmental organizations. And then individuals like ourselves, the dermatologists must be actively involved, the pri uh, public health physicians, and our various associations so that we can combat the stigma and ensure that you know human rights are respected and leprosy is eliminated. So accelerate progress towards zero leprosy in line with the sustainable development goals, contact tracing. This is cannot be overemphasized, active case finding, provision of the multi-drug therapy services. These are all critical activities that will interrupt the transmission. And lastly, the gains must be sustained to ensure that there is elimination in the next decade. I'd like to acknowledge the Glow Drum Training Committee and thank them for inviting us. Those who have worked back uh, behind the scenes to help us with our slides, Akash, Claire, and the whole team, the social media team, um, our Hansen's patients, the pathologists who've helped us with pictographs. I'd like to recognize and acknowledge my consult, my fellow consultants, Dr. Ayolowo and Dr. Otrofanoe and all the residents in our dermatology units, very big unit, and they've all played a part in um, management of these cases over the years. And I'd like to thank you for the webinar 
participants for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Akinkube, Dr. Aino, and Dr. Odiase on the wonderful presentation on Hansen's disease. It's been quite enlightening. We have a few questions in the chat box that I will read to you. And uh, the first one is, which organs are not affected in leprosy? Did you get the question? Yes, we did. Are you going to take quite a few and then we can take I've, them I've together? Grouped, I've grouped the common questions. So we'll just go step by step, one by one. Okay, so commonly, I mean, it's, it's asked what is not affected. We'll start with what's affected. The peripheral nervous system is affected. The central nervous system is not affected. You also have the respiratory system affected, the eyes, the nose. You have the kidneys, you have the testicles. You also have the bones affected. So the cardiac system is not affected and the central nervous system. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what was the diagnosis for each of those ears? There's a slide that had four, an image of four ears. So somebody is asking about the differential diagnosis for each of them. The differential diagnosis or the final diagnosis? The final diagnosis in each of those patients was lepromatous leprosy. That was why we coned in on taking the pictures of the ears. Differentials include um, Lobo's, Lobo's disease. Um, I think I put them up there, sarcoidosis, uh, polychondritis. They could also look like keloids that are found on the ears when um, individuals have pierced the ears. But, you know, it wasn't on its own. And in, in general, with the common, with the complete picture, it goes along with the leonine fasces and other signs that you, features that you would find in lepromatous leprosy. Thank you. Uh, someone else has asked, can rifampicin be given daily with other broad spectrum antibiotics? Um, well, you first of all have to wonder why you're giving the rifampicin with a broad spectrum antibiotic. So what's the reason? If it is straightforward leprosy, then you want to, you know, you don't want to have a broad spectrum antibiotic given alongside. However, you must bear in mind that there are drug-drug interactions. And so we should um, use the drugs with caution. So it would really depend on why you needed to give a broad spectrum antibiotic alongside the rifampicin. Thank you. Uh, explain the mechanism by which toes and fingers are lost in leprosy patients. So there's affectation of the peripheral nerves, and this is what um, gives, you, gives you the palsy. Um, you can also have um, ulcers that are developed as a result of you lacking sensation. So you, you, have, you could stub your toe, you could um, step on, well, something, you could get burnt, you know, so, and then cutting of the nails and things like that, where you're not able to, you have lack of sensation. And so that results in trauma and the ulcers, and then there's eventual destruction. It can extend to the bones and you have the palsy of the affected nerves. And so you have your foot drop or you have a claw hand um, deformity that ensues. So those are the disabilities that we you know, want to prevent by making sure we diagnose um, and detect it earlier. Okay, thank you. Um, what are your ideas on how to eliminate leprosy effectively? Um, I think the last slides um, speak to that. It's by increasing awareness. We all have, as dermatologists, as budding resident dermatologists, I think we all have a role to play, particularly in countries where um, leprosy is endemic and still exists. We need to get to zero tolerance. So we need to look back. I mean, if I take my country, for example, we need to increase the awareness out there in the community. And as I said, from the pharmacists, the patent medical stores, the GPs, you know, these, these conditions are missed. So we've got to go into the community. Then we've got to be more deliberate and intentional about contact tracing because that in itself is where you have the infected individual still in the community and the spread is going on undeterred. So I think those are the um, mechanisms by which we can eliminate um, 
leprosy. And I would advise everyone to go and look at the global strategy for the next decade. And let's try and partner with the collaborators or collaborate with the stakeholders. And let's make a difference because at the end of the day, we as the dermatologists see the end stage of leprosy and that's what we want to prevent. So it's more of advocacy. Thank you. Um, another question, in case of contact with a patient with lepromatous leprosy, what would you advise? And then any, is there any prophylaxis available? Did you get me? No, I didn't. My, 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 the network was a bit shaky. I didn't hear the complete question. Okay, let me repeat. In case of contact with a patient with lepromatous leprosy, what would you advise? And is there any prophylaxis for this patient? So in a case of lepromatous leprosy, it's the contact tracing you want to see you know, reach out to all the contacts, have them on your list with the public health physicians so they can, you know, follow them up. We should, we can screen them immediately and then we, they should be um, examined annually for the next five years after being in contact with someone with lepromatous leprosy. That's the ideal thing to do. And is there any prophylaxis available? Okay, uh, the next question is, the next question is, what is the relationship between diabetes, HIV, and leprosy? Can you hear? Uh, what is the relationship between diabetes, HIV, and leprosy? Did you get me? Um, I think we've lost Dr. Akenkube. Let's just give her um, a second. In the meantime, I'll just give you guys some updates about what's to come. So we do have a new talk coming up in February called Leveraging Disease Registries to do research as a trainee, um, led by Dr. Chris Griffiths from the University of Manchester and Dr. Esther Freeman from Mass General Hospital, Harvard University, also the chair of the Gloderm um, Alliance. And so that'll be our first in the research meetings. So that's something that's very exciting that we're looking forward to. And um, besides that, we're also going to be releasing a lot of educational material on leprosy, thanks to Dr. Gerson de la Torre and Dr. Luisa Polo um, from Brazil, as well as Suzanne Ketlin Martello from Brazil. That'll be on our Instagram page, so please keep an eye look out for that. Um, and as I mentioned, the talk that we have scheduled for February 9th um, with Dr. Freeman and Dr. Chris Griffiths. Has Dr. Akinkabe been able to join again? All right, we'll give her another minute. Thank you guys so much for attending. Um, and thank you, Dr. Aino and Odiase for um, presenting and, and spending time to share this with us. And of course, those of you who are unable to stay, um, you know, we understand. Thank you so much for joining this talk and feel free to um, stay or step out. Oh, there's Dr. Akinkabe. Um, I think you're muted. You just unmute the... 
Sorry, we had a network glitch and everybody went off. Oh, no problem. Okay, so back to the question of contact. There's another question that somebody has asked. Um, in case of contact with a patient, what's the percentage of coming down with leprosy? What's the likelihood of getting leprosy? Well, it's prolonged contact, not just you know brief contact. And the prolonged contact, remember, it's nasal secretions, um, you know, very close contact. So it's not. I mean, the incubation period is long. So if I spend a, a week with somebody, you know, I'm not likely to. It's more of a prolonged contact that um, is important, and that's why the contact tracing is continuous. Because you know, particularly where you have lived with people, family members, or if you're cohabiting, or you're in an institution, in you know, students in university or polytechnics or wherever they may be, you know, you can have that. But it, the key thing is prolonged contact and the contact tracing. All right. So someone else asks, what's the relationship between diabetes, HIV, and leprosy? Um would be the CD, CD8 lymphocytes would be the, you know, co-infection, CD8 lymphocytes. It's um, oh. What's the evidence of complete or successful treatment of leprosy? It would be um, symptoms, well, the, the skin lesions resolving, becoming less indurated. Like if you look at the um, first case we presented, you could see that even after eight months, the plaques had become you know, flattened. The color was a bit better, not as um, deep pigmented or hyperpigmented as it was initially. There's also the patient well-being, them giving you that response. Um, and it, it really just depends on at which stage it is. But it, the, the key thing is the infiltration, the deep infiltration that you have of the dermis. For instance, the leonine fasces, the infiltration of the face, that all starts to resolve. Unfortunately, we didn't have very many after pictures that we could have shown you. However, you find that the leonine fasci has a drastic change and the um, nodules on the air all resolve and the person looks better. And you know the difference is quite clear. However, when there are disabilities, that have set in like foot ulcers, um, that's quite um, bad. The palsy cannot be reversed. So that's where you need physical re rehabilitation. You need to work with your occupational therapy team where they can have splints, you know, um, put into the palsies to improve the um, um, functionality of whatever organ, organ is involved. Uh, one, another question. How do we differentiate between the ulcer of leprosy and other ulcers? Well, the ulcer of leprosy is neuropathic. So you have a loss of sensation. And it's also, um, when you examine, you find that the peripheral nerves are affected and that will differentiate it from the other ulcers that you can find. The other ulcers, you have pressure ulcers, depends on the location as well. Um, what are the typical presentations of leprosy? The atypical. Typical presentations of leprosy. Or the atypical. Um, yeah. You can have lesions where you have both um, hypochromic presentation that doesn't you know, follow the typical presentations that we have highlighted. Um, it's important here to do a biopsy, which will help, you know, in identifying. You could also have your skin slit and smear, um, slit skin and smear, which would help you in um, making the, the diagnosis. Okay. Um, someone else is asking, what is the real definition of resistance leprosy and how do you treat it? Um, drug resistant leprosy is, you can have dapsone or rifampicin resistant, you know, or multi-drug resistant leprosy. Um, and it's been reported in various parts of the world. Um, it usually will happen when persons have um, had a relapse, you know, either after they have not taken an adequate um, insufficient therapy 
okay? And it's usually, you know, you usually find it several years after completion of therapy. So the last question, um, is congenital leprosy possible? Um, I, I must say that I don't think it is. <laughs> I know that most cases of leprosy come from an infected mother, you know, and you have pediatric cases of um, leprosy. And that's why you still find that there is a lot of new cases detected amongst children. Thank you. So I, I would definitely say it's not congenital anyway. That would be the answer to that question. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Aisha, Dr. Aino, and um, Dr. Odiase. Back to you, Akash. All right, thank you guys so much for that presentation. It was really enlightening and educational and timely considering World Leprosy Day is coming up in 11 days. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Dr. Kinkube, Dr. Odiase, Dr. Aino. I hope the attendees had an educational talk. I know that I did. Um, and we look forward to working with you guys again. Um, and yeah, I think that was, that was great. Thank you guys so much.